in my own experience as a painter of Black Mountain, I uh, am claimed by each of the following men as their students. Right? Motherwell, Ben Sean, Jack Torkoff, Bill de Cooney, Franz Klein. It's, well, in a sense, I wasn't any of their students. Really, if I was a student of anybody's, it was Joe Fiore. Joe really finally got me painting in San Francisco. And uh, it's Joe that I learned more about painting from than any of those other fellows. I can remember Motherwell never saw anything, never came to my studio while he was teaching there. I put a thing in a group exhibition and he said, uh, no, he didn't say anything. And yet he still claims me as a student. He gave me a grade, in other words, but on the basis of what, I certainly don't know. Uh, Torkoff um, looked at a couple of paintings and said, that's very ambitious. Uh, at the time, I had a, was painting in a style that was sort of subtractive, that is, uh, the final result of the painting was an overlay of color allowing underpainting to come through in various forms. Uh, and he didn't understand. I mean, he didn't get the idea. Why, if you make a painting, he said, do you then cover it over? Which may have been a good point, but it wasn't of any use to me. But uh, I'm just saying this because that's the extent of Jack Torkoff's teaching. Uh, Stamos saw like about one painting, and he liked it very much called Clem Greenberg and, and mm -hmm. said, look, there is a painter of Black Mountain, because he was pretty sick of what Albers had left behind. <laughs> Who was, Greenberg or? Uh, Both. Both. Yeah. And they asked me, did I want to be in the Whitney Annual, which I said no, because I didn't have a, really a body of work so I felt back that kind of position up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's the extent, oh, I, I, he suggested that I not demarcate one area of painting with a line, but simply leave the color to do, to do it. In other words, the line that I had in the painting uh, was uh, unnecessary, sort of redundancy. Mm -hmm. My knowledge, that's the only positive <laughs> suggestion out of any of these guys that, uh, that taught me. Sean? Once took a piece of paper and tore out a little hole in it and passed it over the surface of uh, uh, a Rualt that was hanging in the reading room and said, see, 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 he, you know, as he passed through the detail of the painting, he said, now there's an abstract painting, now there's an abstract painting, so, see, so what do you want to do it for? <laughs> All it is is like little details of good painting. So, but And yet, each of these guys claim me as their student. I think probably, uh, just to finish this part yeah, of the talk, is awesome. uh, I learned more from Klein than I have any single man about painting. But that was from sitting around um, bars, <laughs> talking to him. And, uh, Back in New York, you mean? At Black Mountain. Oh, at too. Black Mountain. Uh, Peaks, or was that the place? Peaks, yeah. yeah. Peaks place. He had a marvelous style of teaching, which was not to talk about painting, but to talk about anything around painting, uh, anything practically but painting, but somehow <coughs> making it all apply. He had a magic wizardry. Oddly enough, uh, I find these later years, uh, thinking about him, uh, that he was almost a verbal genius. Couldn't you could never recall uh, how he made this possible? But by using, like, say, a salt and pepper shaker and, or a can of beer, talking about just moving these objects around, you talk about. Fantastically uh, delicate life problems or uh, problems of, in, in painting, but never.
never talking directly to the point. It's a, a kind of a marvel of imagery. Can you, can you give me any? Uh, no, that's the thing. That's the thing about it. You could never can't recapture. repeat, recapture, or even rethink exactly what it was. All you knew is that you knew what he was talking about while he wasn't talking about it. He was he was always indirectly talking about whatever it was that he wanted to talk about. And you could follow him and know at the time exactly what he was saying, but ten minutes later you couldn't you couldn't redo it. So I've never seen anybody uh, exactly like that. What are some of the things in looking back that you derived from it? Uh, you talked of many levels on which it was worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I know it's a whopper, and if you rather well, reserve no, it, well, no, no, I, I, I can. Uh, I think it's one of those questions that I'll think of many more things that I should say later about it, but just as an immediate response to it, I learned, uh, or perhaps, I'll say, perhaps, perhaps one of the most valuable experiences out of Black Mountain uh, was the living with these people, uh, the intimacy uh, with which we lived together, the social and political results, uh, which were obvious at the time, uh, taught me an enormous amount about people, about, uh, well, how to put it, the organism of institution, of uh, social institution. The organism of personal relationship in a large general way, just like how it works uh, when you put people together. And certainly just the raw experience of being close to people when things are going on, trouble, and, uh, success, fights, etc. Love, hate, yeah. That's, uh, but with people of extreme uh, intelligence and talent, etc., there's no other way to, to learn that kind of thing, to experience it, uh, except by you know, going through it uh, empirically. And in those terms, you know, I learned a lot fast. jammed, compressed uh, a lot of that stuff in a very short time. Everybody that went to Black Mountain, I think, was extremely affected by it. You call the president of the American Philosopher Society, Bill, and you work with the Who's farmer, oh, Bill Levy. Is he head of the American? He was. At the oh, time. Yeah. And uh, you wash dishes with him, you bring in hay with Ray Trayer, you can talk to him and know him as a lovely Quaker, uh, pacifist, etc. And then you see Trayer knock Bill Levy down to the ground, you know, <laughs> and uh, you, you know, it's, that's a lot to um, take in. Yeah. In my absence, uh, Charlie Olson had come to deliver a lecture and spend some time, I, I don't think it was very long, maybe summer, that was it, it came as a summer thing. Brought primarily because it was a book, uh, Call Me Ishmael, and uh, he delivered a lecture that I didn't hear, but my brother was there at the time, he wrote me a long thing about it, he was very excited by it. Uh, it was, uh, the first part of the lecture was Proving that Shakespeare was one of those guys and he was yeah, something I don't know exactly who Olson had theoretically decided uh, it was. Uh, the second half of the lecture was proving that Shakespeare was not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he turned everybody on and then turned them off. And uh, 
point being, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I returned, uh, Olson was just coming back again. But as a sort of as a regular faculty member. And uh, no, I think again it was just a summer job because he did then split at the end of the summer and came back after a few months. The introduction of Olson into Black Mountain started tremendous change in, in the school, which finally described its uh, last days, uh, the character that it had in its last years. It's somewhere between 52 and 53 that in 52, it's often described to me as still a thriving, uh, going institution, but it never yeah. is after that. You see, that at that time, uh, that's when Olsen finally gained what could be called a control. In 52. Around that period. Yeah. As I say, I'm terrible years. Yeah, right. But uh, it was in that period that Olsen, that began Olsen tenure as rector or whatever. Rector, yeah. I forget exactly what year it was that he was officially given the title, but uh, long before he was officially rector. He was the, the force of the school, as Albers had been during his period. Levy, the trouble, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why Levy never was able to maintain the control that he won twice. Yeah, uh, I'm confused about his career. Uh, right? It's simply because his force, that he as a force in the school, kind of mystical thing, implemented practically, uh, was not satisfying to the students and not satisfying to the faculty. Uh, so it just didn't work. Not larger than life. So actually, Olson was the first after Albers to really pull that off. Who had the charisma and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And the talent. Yeah. Financially, the school didn't you could not call it going to that. As far as the spirit of the school went, uh, yes. That was a great spirit. And that was a great time in Black Mountain's uh, career. That's ideas started popping again. And, uh, many things were underway. It, it looked good. It's, it's, there was hope, let's put it that way. More and more, of course, uh, after Dreyer left, uh, the financial problem in school be became the uppermost in everybody's mind. As far as the problem with just existence. By the, oh, say, 55, maybe in 54, I think everybody realized.